Rob Henderson made it out of the chaos of poverty and the foster care system to eventually receive his PhD from Yale. We chat about the psychology of poverty, status games of the elites, and class warfare. Just mentioned to you, Rob, first off, wonderful to chat with you. Uh, I have enjoyed, I read a bunch of your substacks in preparation from this, and I really, really enjoyed the first chapter of your book. You start off talking about your three names, and I was very moved by the beginning of your story, which gets increasingly uh, unlikely as you grow <laughs> through over time. So can you start just by telling me, like, what, what did you talk about in the book with those three names? What do they mean to you? Right. Yeah. My So my full name is Robert Kim Henderson, and each of my three names was taken from a different adult. So my first name, Robert, comes from my uh, biological father. Um, so he left my mother and me when I was a baby. And so I, I don't know him. I have no memory of him. Uh, my middle name, Kim, comes from my uh, biological mother, and she succumbed to drug addiction um, you know, a little bit after I was born. And so she wasn't able to take care of me. So I entered the foster care system in Los Angeles. And then my last name, Henderson, comes from my former adoptive father. And so after my adoptive mother separated from him, he uh, stopped speaking to me. Um, and so, you know, I have no more contact with him. And so each of my three names was taken from a different adult who, uh, you know, essentially neglected or abandoned or otherwise uh, sort of refused care. And so I use these three names as a sort of way to understand my life story and how it sort of connects to sort of broader patterns of like family dysfunction and breakdown in the U.S. and what's going on with poor and working class people. And so that was just a sort of a device to help people sort of understand like, you know, here's my life and uh, here's what we'll be speaking about in, in, in my story and in my book, my forthcoming book. And yeah, this was, um, you know, there's, there's a lot there and we can, you know, we can touch a, a bit more on this, but that is sort of the, uh, a glimpse into sort of the circumstances I grew up in. Yeah. We, uh, you just said, and I'll let the, the viewers who are going to be screaming at me to ask anecdotes. We just talked about holding sure. the book stuff for another conversation, which I'm happy to do. Um, but I, I was, I don't know, I was deeply, deeply moved by that. And I guess the crux I can frame perhaps the entire conversation is how the heck did you come through that? Uh, I feel like in a lot of your work, that question is implicit in, you know, what, what helps people, what doesn't help people to emerge from those situations. So I'm curious, as you look back at that childhood, we could talk about how you, you know, have arrived where you are, what what how did you get through and how did you arrive where you are today which seems so unlikely yeah yeah i mean it's it's funny like even even as i was sort of preparing and sort of you know like like even now i'm still learning things about my early life my uh so my my father so so i knew my mother you know my middle name is kim you know my mother mm -hmm. uh birth mother she was korean uh from seoul she came to the u.s to study and then she got into drugs and so that was sort of the path that she ended up taking but i actually had no memory of my dad but then um you know, I had these documents from my social worker basically saying like my mother didn't know either um, who my dad was. And then I took a 23 in me like, you know, six or eight months ago or something. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't even know like my, my ethnicity uh, on my father's side. And it turns out he was, he was Hispanic. He had ancestry from Mexico and Spain. So, you know, I'm, I'm half, uh, half Latinx or whatever the term, <laughs> whatever the term people are using now. I think I'm allowed oh, that's to say awesome. that. You know? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, 100%. You're 50% <laughs> able to say that. I yeah, take that 50%. back. <laughs> I'm allowed to say it. Yeah. Half as much as someone with, yeah. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the question of sort of how I, how I got here, you know, I, I think it's, it's a good question and it's a, and it's, uh, it can be helpful, but, um, you know, it's it's part of the reason why I'm even able to sort of speak about these issues and why people are willing to listen is because the story is so unlikely. You know, I've I've studied the statistics. I've sort of looked at uh, sort of the patterns of social mobility in America. And so, if you're a child in the U.S. born to the bottom quintile, basically, if you're born into a poor family in the U.S., your chances of graduating from college are about 11 percent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not great. It's you know, on, on average in the U.S., it's around 35 percent. So, 11 percent, it's pretty low. You know, if you're born to a poor family. Uh, for a foster kid, it's 3%. If you're born and, and raised in foster care, your chances of graduating from college are only 3%. So essentially, if you are born into a poor family uh, in the U.S., you're four times more likely to graduate from college than if you spend time in foster care. I mean, that's how stacked the odds are um, in that kind of stability that or instability and in that squalor um, in that system. And so there are a lot of a lot of things, you know, it's it's hard for me to sort of disentangle everything. I think, you know, part of why I got here and sort of achieve these uh, conventional bad news of success 
I was always sort of a naturally curious kid. Um, and so I was, you know, so I think the, 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 the raw ingredients were already there. Um, but it was just sort of, I was, I was in an intellectually and material and emotionally impoverished situation where those good parts of me didn't really shine through Mm -hmm. until later. Um, when I enlisted in the military and sort of got out of that environment, I, I enlisted when I was 17 out of desperation just to get out of that. Um, and that was when my life started to sort of take shape and stabilize a bit. And I got some good mentors. I mean, it was funny, even along the way though, you know, I was in school and stuff, you know, teachers would recognize they're like, you're a smart kid. Like, what are you doing? You know, I'm goofing off with my friends, not paying attention in class. You know, later by the time I entered high school, I was doing drugs and getting blackout drunk and racing on the freeway and just doing all of this, uh, (laughs) really, um, reckless stuff. And there were adults who could see, like they could glimpse something in me, like you have Mm -hmm. some potential. Why would you do this? And for me, it was just fun. I think I was running from something. I didn't want to acknowledge that I wasn't living up to my own potential. And then later the military kind of helped and, and sort of evened me out a bit and gave me some time to reflect and focus. Um, but the other thing is like, I don't think that my path is replicable for everyone either. I think, you know, I spend a good portion of my book and I think about my friends and, you know, talking about them and no matter what environment I think you put most kids in, um, you know, they're, you're not going to necessarily be able to like get them into, you know, uh, college and, and, and go on to get a PhD and like sort of follow the same path that I took. The other thing is that even if every single kid who grew up the way that I did went to, uh, you know, I ended up going on to some kind of fancy college, getting, you know, an expensive degree, going on to attain kind of conventional success that doesn't necessarily make up for their early life experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it's more important for kids to have sort of safety and security and positive attention at home. And regardless of where their life takes them next, I think sort of having a safe, secure, you know, uh, loving a childhood, that's a good in itself, regardless of what happens next. Yeah. And so, so that's something else I think is, is sort of important to keep in mind is like, you know, it's not, we're looking at the wrong end of my life in a sense, like, you know, you ended up successful. How great for you. It's fine. You know, that's, you know, I'm not saying it's not important, but the other end of life, that part, I think that's what we need to focus more on, not how to get kids to college, but how to ensure that they don't grow up in instability and poverty and squalor mm-hmm. in the first place. Yeah. You have a, you, uh, have a number of these, but it's uh, a very useful structure for thinking about this, which is that there's many different kinds of poverty and we tend to focus only on financial poverty, but some of the other kinds of poverty, whether it's social poverty or a total lack of love can be as or more debilitating than that. And, um, as you were speaking, I couldn't help but think of, you know, I I sort of saw that theme in some of what you'd written of adults that had reflected yourself back to you that said, Hey, I see that you have potential. I see something in you. And I think of Jordan Peterson and the effect that he has on people When he stands with them and he says, I see what you can do. I believe in you. And it does seem that we vastly underestimate the power of a grounded adult looking at a kid and saying, I see, (laughs) I see you. I see what you're going through and I believe in you. Uh, And that, I I don't know, that stuck out to me in your answer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Jordan's influence is so powerful. I mean, even like when I first, I don't know, how old was I? Jordan was one reason why I decided to apply to grad school in psychology. So I did undergrad in psych and then got a PhD in psych. And that was part of the reason was Jordan's influence. Mm -hmm. And I I mean, I must have been 20, how old was I? 27, I think. So it was like already a little bit older, I think, than like the average whatever lost boy who finds Jordan Peterson's videos. And even then, you know, by that point, you know, I was in college, I'd been in the military. It had like, I was basically an adult, you know, full-fledged adult. And then I find Jordan Pearson and even, you know, the, the power of his um, encouragement and his advice and um, his sort of focused determination that really had an effect on me. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, those those moments, even as a kid, you know, I, I when I was, um, yeah, when I was like 12 or 13, I was in, uh, I, I enrolled in these local, uh, in this local kickboxing gym. And one of the other students who was in the class with me, so I, you know, I was, I was pretty good at it. So I was already in the adult class. And there was this um, retired school teacher, uh, this guy. Uh, so there were two guys in this boxing gym. There was young Joe and old Joe. Uh, and so old Joe was the retired um, uh, school teacher. And he still worked in the, the administration at the local high school. And, you know, he's like, I couldn't afford the classes. So I'd stick around and like I'd, I'd help clean up. I'd sweep him off the floors or I'd help like teach the little kids classes. 
like I do what I could to sort of hang out at the gym and like just that was like one good source of sort of stability and oversight in my life. It's a good influence. And so old Joe would see me and, you know, one day he was giving a ride home to school and he was asking me like, you know, you're about to start high school. Um, you know, what are your plans? Are you going to go to college? What do you want to do? And I was like, I, even, even though like I, my life was sort of at that point relatively stable, um, I still didn't think of myself as college material. I'd been sort of so, I guess, beaten down by my experiences that I didn't really have that um, sort of vision for myself of going on to college. So I just said, oh, I don't know, maybe maybe the military, I'm not really sure. And he was like, well, look, Rob, no matter where you end up, I'm sure you're going to do fine. He said something like that, you know, where no matter where you end up, you're going to be OK. And that stuck with me like, you know, this is what, 20 years later. Mm-hmm. And uh, that memory stuck with me, you know, and I and I and I held on to that. That was like one of the few times that someone I respected and admired gave this, you know, very sort of small compliment to me. And I and I hung on to that. And it sort of stayed with me. And um, even when I wasn't doing OK in my life, I thought back and said, OK, well, I can make my way out of this because old Joe said, no matter where I end up, I'll be OK. Yeah, that's so powerful. I've really I've seen that in my own life as I get a little bit older and interact with younger people that having someone whom you admire see what is actually in you is so powerful i again was i don't know if you've thought of it in this particular lens but jordan i've seen talk about uh maternal types of love and paternal types of love and it does seem that our society in the discourse at least tends to this maternal oh my gosh we need to help you you need uh more money more support how do we solve this by um bringing you closer and and seeing your victimization and your weakness and loving that and there seems to be a more traditionally paternal type of love, which is, I see that, I believe in you, you have what it takes, stand up on your own, the, uh, I, you know, there's a, an availability of support, but it is not endless, and it is, uh, at some point, I'm going to leave you on your own, because I know that you can do it. And I'm curious if you've th- thought about any of those lenses in terms of, you know, class or, or politics or any of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that sort of that kind of paternal love can be really, really useful. Um, you know, I was, yeah, I, 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 well, yeah, I think like a lot of, well, this is what a lot of young guys are missing, right? Like a lot of young guys are sort of missing that. I mean, if you look at the sort of growing rates of fatherlessness in the U S mm-hmm. I mean, so, so like, you know, one, uh, one study that I've, I've found and I've, and I've written about this. Um, so if you go back to 1960 in the U S uh, about 95% of of kids, uh, regardless of social class, were raised by both of their birth parents. 95%, whether you were upper class or or lower class. Um, and this is, you know, classes are defined roughly by whether you have a college degree and how much money you earn and so on. But rough, upper class and lower class, same, regardless of your class, were raised by both of their birth parents. And then if you fast forward to 2005, for the upper class, it dropped from 95% to 85%. So just a slight drop vast majority of upper class kids raised by both of the birth parents still to this day. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you go to the lower class, um, it dropped from 95% in 1960 to 30% by 2005. And that number is actually even smaller today. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's uh, it's anomalous now uh, in a lot of neighborhoods in the U.S. to find uh, kids who have both of their birth parents, uh, who have their father sticking around um, maybe they'll have some stepfather or mother's boyfriend or something. But if you look at the statistics on that, typically, um, you know, if the if the um, uh, if a par- if a child's parents are unmarried when they're born, uh, their likelihood of separating them by the kid time, by the time the kid is five years old, it's it's above fifty percent. I mean, it's you know basically that you know, there's mm-hmm. there's no father sort of male influence in, in a young kid's life. Uh, very um, unlikely unless it's the the biological father. Or if you know if it's stepfather, but they're married before the kid's born, and so I think that that absence uh, a lot of young men are feeling. And so you know, the, the, it's funny we have this sort of structural change in the U.S. where a lot of kids aren't raised with their, by their dads, and then someone like Jordan Peterson comes along, or some you know life coach, or more sort of uh, uh, toxic figures arise on the internet, and kids are you know young boys especially are drawn to it, and then people are like shocked by this, or upset by it, or confused by it. It's like it's not it's not that confusing if you look historically or even in more sort of traditional small scale societies today, um, you know, from, from developing countries, like every, you know, there's, there's a sort of a masculine tradition and boys sort of go through these sort of rites Mm -hmm. of passage and go from that, that demarcation from being a boy to being a man. And we don't really have that anymore. And there's no sort of guidance, uh, in our, in our personal life. So naturally people are, are finding it on the internet. Yeah. 
I feel like I'm doing that at age 35. I feel like I'm uh, exiting my adolescent phase and finally <laughs> entering into maturity at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I'm right there with you, man. I'm, I'm 33. <laughs> so <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy how long it took. And for me, I did have both parents present. But for whatever reason, I had this extended adolescence, which was not cruel or vicious, but just self selfish in the sense of like, I'm going to travel and I'm going to make this and I'm going to earn money for myself and I'm going to have a ton of fun, uh, which I don't think necessarily came at the expense of anybody. But there wasn't I'm finally tuned into, uh, I guess, finally, like a deep, deep sense of service that I am just scratching the surface of at this point. I wonder if that that resonates with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think like it takes it takes a while, especially if you don't have someone like telling you or mm -hmm. someone you respect, um, uh, you know, reiterating this point that, you know, it's it's fine. I think when you're very young, you know, sort of exiting adolescence, your early adulthood, maybe teens, early 20s, that, um, you know, you have to build yourself up into someone um, sort of worthy of listening to. Mm -hmm. But then at a certain point, um, the way that you sort of derive satisfaction and meaning and fulfillment in life is to sort of give back to people um, who also uh, could could use some assistance. I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced this myself. I mean, there were, you know, I my, my journey from sort of where I was to where I am now, there were adults along the way who sort of helped me, who gave me some advice and so on. And so, so by the time I got to college, um, you know, there were two things that I found a surprising amount of meaning from. One was tutoring uh, little kids from disadvantaged environments, mm -hmm. um, and so I'd go once a week uh, to this uh, to New Haven Reads and and tutor these kids. And then the other thing was uh, helping military veterans get into school. You know, so there were people who helped me sort of find my path from being enlisted to uh, using the GI Bill to go on to college. And then I became that person who was sort of helping uh, people along the way. And I remember there's one guy, this former Marine who grew up. And maybe an even at least as bad as environment as me, maybe worse. Um, you know, so he's a former Marine, and then we got him into to college. And I remember he he was so elated, like he didn't think you know, all along the way he was he was doubtful. And I remember that feeling because I felt that too. And once he got in, man, like I felt I probably felt happier learning that he got in than when I got in because yeah. you know I could I was happy and he was happy, so it sort of multiplied that feeling, you know. Um, and so so yeah, I think like giving back is uh, is something that especially if you don't have kids, right? Like I, you know, I think this is, this is like our generation. Right? We're, not really, <laughs> we're not really reproducing the way that the old generation did. <laughs> like so we're we need sort to. of learning it a different way. <laughs> yeah. That, um, you know, taking the mentorship roles, um, has been surprisingly fulfilling. Mm. I am just really touching in that. And it, and it also, I guess I've done it over time, but it is the ability to help someone with the support that you needed, whether you got it or didn't, is a deeply fulfilling. It, it, you feel it, they feel it. Like you said, it gets doubled. And uh, yeah, if you're listening, I hope I hope that that moves something in you. There was I want to go back to something you said. Uh, you were talking about this fatherlessness that is occurring, particularly in the lower class. Um, and a question that arose is that I've heard broadly two camps that I don't know I've ever I've sussed this out. One group of people thinks that the breakdown of the communitarian societies to the nuclear family was a huge, tremendous loss. And we like lost that community thing. The other group thinks that the nuclear family is the absolute atom of society and that what we need to do is get back to that nuclear family. I'm wondering if if you agree with either of those or see merit to both, like what are, what is your research shown? Was it the was it losing that 150 tribe that really like screwed us up or is it losing that tribe of four or five that is at, that is throwing things away? I mean both of those are important because, so even when you look at um even when you look at sort of those extended family, that sort of communitarian style, the nuclear family is still sort of the base of mm -hmm. that, you know. I mean, it's, it's you know, sometimes it's a bit fluid where a kid will go off and live with an aunt and uncle for a while or maybe stay with the grandparents while the parents are working. But generally, like, it's understood that the, the, the mother and the father, they still get married and they still have sort of uh, you know, privileged access to their own children. And, like, people are understood, like, this is the mother and father. They have this sort of highest claim. And it's up to the parents to decide, okay, well, we'll leave them for the, with the grandmother while we go to work or whatever. And, um, and so, so I think either way, you know, I know there was that popular article in the Atlantic a couple of years ago, the nuclear family was a mistake. It was kind of mm -hmm. this, you know, provocative article, but it was arguing sort of for a return to that communitarian style of family. And I understood it and I thought it was interesting. Um, but we're not, you know, I, I, you still need the nuclear family. It's still sort of an essential part of that communitarian style. Of, mm -hmm. of family um and and i think yeah we're we have lost 
well, we've lost both now. We don't really yeah. have either one. And if you have money now, if you're sort of upper, upper middle class, you can sort of pay for a like a facsimile of that communitarian environment where you can have like a nanny and a babysitter <laughs> yeah. and a, you know it's you could have like different people you can sort of outsource you know the the work of maybe an aunt or a grandfather or grandmother or something an uncle and instead just hire these you know instead of you have you know coaches and and uh and you know violin practice and all these other kind therapists of therapists and yeah everybody <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah right yeah maybe back in the day you know you'd you'd uh, express your emotions to your grandparents and now mm-hmm. you got the you know you pay you know a couple hundred dollars an hour for a stranger to listen to your kids um and and so now if you look at the working class the poor uh they don't have that i mean they, they don't even have their own parents right you know maybe the, the the their parent is working and so they have no adult oversight whatsoever um, and you know, of course they can't afford coaches and teachers and all these other kinds of things. And so by and large, yeah, there's, there's no adult oversight whatsoever. And so they end up sort of influencing one another, you know, kids and, mm-hmm. and often that leads to, leads into a sort of negative, negative direction. Yeah. Did you notice in your childhood that there was a distinct separation of the generations? This is something that I've been feeling like a loss of. I didn't know that I was missing it, but it was me, my mom, my dad, and everyone else I knew was my age, but there was not someone 10 years older and then 10 years older and then five years older. There wasn't like varying gradations of, hey, kid, I am with you because I'm in high school, but I can see that middle, I can help you with your middle school problems in a way that my dad couldn't, you know, and and that loss of, you know, you've got your grade, your same thing in sports, and then people that are 25 years older than you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have that. I mean, I didn't have any. Um, yeah, well, like I had older cousins, but it, like we're we're dispersed now. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you have family, they're sort of spread out. You're not living in the same village or the same neighborhood anymore. And yeah, I, I, I never, it never like sort of surfaced as a conscious thought. But looking back, I did. Yeah, it would have been nice to have someone who was five or ten or fifteen years older, sort of in that older sibling, you know, mm-hmm. maybe like young uncle category to give some, some guidance. I mean, I, so I had a younger sister and yeah, I remember, yeah, like she and I have talked since then. So she's three, three years younger than me. And yeah, she and I have talked since then. And she said, she, you know, she's expressed this sort of appreciation to have an older sibling, you know, talking about like how much, how helpful that was for her, especially like as she was entering middle school and high school and she'd ask questions and stuff. And so that was helpful for her. Um, but yeah, to, to not have that. And then I think for, it's better. It's beneficial in both senses, right? So it would be beneficial for the individual to have a, a, a mentor of some kind mm-hmm. above them, but then also exercise mentorship for someone uh, yeah. slightly uh, more junior to themselves. And yeah, that was um, yeah. That's 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 a good point. Yeah, I feel I feel that that loss of, and I'm trying to you know I have to take steps to incorporate it because I have my atomized house and my atomized thing. And as you get wealthier, you get even farther from your neighbors, which is a luxury but also a loss of community. And so I have to take steps to uh, connect with people and not just people my own age, people that are a little bit younger, a little bit older. And I've seen just recently tremendous value from both being a mentee and like the gift of being a mentor and going, oh my God, that would have been nice. <laughs> you know, that yeah. would have been so nice to have. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so interesting, man. So so my, my girlfriend is, uh, she's from Malaysia and I visited last year and Malaysia is a developing country. It's, it's far poorer than the U.S., and yet, you know, so I, you know, but I'd walk around the villages and like materially more impoverished than the neighborhoods I grew up in. Um, you know, you go into some houses and it was just like cement floors, like no, um, you know, the, no, no, no carpet or, or hardwood or anything. It's just cement. Like that's the floor. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and yet despite the sort of material poverty, uh, people were generally more upbeat uh, and, and they lived in this sort of communitarian style. Where you had the, the the uncles and the aunties and the the great grandparents, the grand like or the great aunts and the grandparents, and everyone was there, and you know kids sort of looking out for their neighbors, and you know the, the little boy going over to feed my uh, you know uh, the old elderly neighbor's dog and doing chores for them, and that is like I I I almost never saw anything like that on occasion, but it's it's very rare to see something like that in a sort of a working class neighborhood in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, and and yeah, so. It's, it's interesting because we, at least in the West, in the U.S., we think of a lot of these problems, sort of social dysfunction as rooted in poverty and economic issues, when I don't think that's the case. I mean, there are some, there are many countries that are poorer than the U.S., 
and they don't have that same level of sort of disconnect and that kind of breakdown in the atomization. Uh, it's something else. I mean, in, in some ways, you could almost argue the opposite, where these countries, um, these more impoverished countries, are almost forced to be more social because they lack the material resources. So then they have to sort of check in on one another. And, you know, if, if one neighborhood or one, one house in the neighborhood doesn't have any food, the other family, you know, goes and feeds them. And so they build those relationships and those ties because they're sort of forced to by necessity. Mm -hmm. Whereas now you don't really need to talk to anyone to survive anymore, right? Like you can just sort of live in your house and, um, you know, never speak to anyone, have your food delivered and, and just sort of live that sort of isolated life. And it's um, almost a, a sort of side effect of, of wealth rather than, than impoverishment in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like as we've developed, it has created a more individualistic or, you know, you get these smaller units of people and uh, an emphasis on freedom, a uh, decrease in a sense of moral duty or obligation or connectedness. And I think there's a beauty to the Western individual because I, I lived in Costa Rica for a year, experienced a lot of the same things. No hot water, no this, but these just families, tight, tight. And the communitarian thing does tend to stomp on the individual, meaning like, hey, is there an artist in this family? Well, guess what? Not if the dad's a mechanic and he's planned for his son to be a mechanic, like all of the uncles and yeah. all of the and all of the this. So it's, you know, I guess a hopeful vision Trade for the offs. future. Well, I, I hope that they can both be integrated. And I think that they can. I think that we're like sorting through, okay, we tried the hardcore individual thing and we saw that even as we got more money that people started killing themselves and doing all of this kind of stuff. What can we take that is wonderful and good from the communitarian style, bring it back without that oppressive, um, doesn't even need to be patriarchal or matriarchal, just top down, here's how things are stomping on the individual. I, I think that there's hope for that in the future. There's some really interesting work on on happiness, sort of the, the research in uh, like positive psychology. And one of the interesting uh, findings here is that if you if you ask people in, in sort of more developed in Western countries, um, you know, p people who, who highly value happiness and who value the pursuit of happiness a lot tend to actually be less happy than average. Mm -hmm. And people in more interdependent societies and in more sort of, uh, you know, developing countries, uh, the people who value happiness and its pursuit a lot tend to be happier than, mm -hmm. than average. And one, one possibility that, that researchers have, have suggested is that because in Western countries, we think of happiness as tied to um, sort of conventional measures of success, you know, getting an uh, education and getting a high paying job and getting a prestigious job title and fancy car and nice house and sort of material objects. And so we're relentlessly pursuing sort of material indicators of, of success. And then we find that it actually doesn't make us as happy as we would have thought. Whereas in more interdependent societies, um, their idea of happiness is actually through relationships, through uh, social roles, through fulfilling obligations, taking care of their family and their friends and their neighborhood. And through that pursuit of doing that, they actually do become happy. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, we sort of overlook our relationships in favor of, you know, material success. Like, you know, we'll, we're willing to very quickly relocate for a job uh, and uproot ourselves and, and cut off regular contact with our friends or our family or loved ones in pursuit of this idea of success when, um, you know, at least uh, according to a lot of this happiness research, we'd actually be arguably better off sort of staying in the job that maybe isn't as prestigious or isn't quite as well paying, but having regular contact with our friends. You know, there's some research indicating that having a having a friend you see regularly has the same effect on happiness as earning an extra $90,000 a year, <laughs> um, which is like, you know, so you, you could almost ask yourself, you know, are you yeah. willing to relocate is that job going to pay you ninety thousand dollars a year or more? And that could almost be the kind of deciding yeah, yeah. factor. You know what I mean? So absolutely. You know, you had another interesting insight about happiness that, that occurred to me, which uh, that we don't we're inauthentic about our signals of happiness. So the one that you highlighted was that it's you know not an evil thing to get divorced, but once you are divorced, there's mounting pressure to be so satisfied with that situation that you write an article for the Atlantic, to, to, you know, saying how wonderful it is. And I see a similar thing on Instagram, which is, you know, you've worked your whole life, you've finally got the Lamborghini, you're deeply dissatisfied with it, but you can't say that on Instagram. You need to, you need to signal that you're happy. And I, I don't know why, but like, yeah, there's this, uh, we are so deceptive. I feel like if people were just honest about their mind states, you would watch a really quick reorganization to the things that actually contribute to happiness. But because we're always involved in this deceptive practice of pretending to be happier than we are, there's all of these very strong signals pulling people 
away from the things that matter. And often they're from the people with the biggest holes who need to post on Instagram, need to write that article, and not the guy who's just meditating with his friends and family because he's he's not so loud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's the the people who are very good at getting attention and often, you know, they, they enjoy that attention because, yeah, they're, they're seeking something uh, to fill that void. That's an interesting point that uh, a lot of people, they may be trying to resolve that cognitive dissonance of, wow, I got the thing that I thought was going to make me happy and I'm mm-hmm. not happy. But in a way, they're, you know, the, the sort of the continuation of that pursuit of happiness is to go on Instagram or, or write an article <laughs> or something and, and sort of get the attention mm-hmm. for it. And maybe that'll make me happy is sort of talking about how it made me happy and getting uh, accolades and likes and retweets or, or whatever and, and, and posts, uh, you know, people tagging me online. That'll make mm-hmm. me happy. And often that doesn't really, it, you know, short term, you get that sort of brief uh, increase in enjoyment, but, but long term, it, it often doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think a lot of our... Uh, uh, attention in our understanding of happiness is sort of misguided and it's sort of we're we're drawn to these figures online but uh yeah yeah like, like that's an interesting point that the truly happy people maybe aren't uh aren't nearly as, as so frequent much. in their posting yeah <laughs> you you really just the one word i think helped me figure this out to a degree attention you know like a child what does a child do when they're starved of love and connection they seek attention and so we don't figure that game out as children we can become adults who substitute the seeking of attention for the deep connection and being seen that we desire you know what that guy with the lamborghini who is not feeling well probably needs is someone to see how miserable he is and love him through that but he never figured that game out because the only game that he was able to play in childhood was the attention game and so he continues his whole life playing bigger and bigger games of attention, which I, you know, I've played that game. It doesn't, I've not got it to work <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it's interesting. You almost have to go through that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you have to sort of like discover it for yourself, a lot of a lot of people, you know, and it's, you know, have you, there's this uh, there's this idea of, uh, you know, the, the 1% rule on the internet. Some people, uh, you know, they, they have, I don't know if it's the same post, but I've, I've encountered this in two independent locations. One, they call it the 1% rule. The other is uh, everything you read on the internet is written by insane people. <laughs> and the idea here is that 1% of people on the internet actually produce any kind of content whatsoever. Um, original content, I mean, you know, podcasts, tweets, whatever. You know, on Twitter, it's something like, um, you know, 20% of people produce 90% of the tweets. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, you know, 1% produce the original content, 9% of people comment on it or interact with it in some way, engage with it. And then 90% of people are just lurkers. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just sort of standing back, observing what's going on. And, uh, and yeah, that 1%, you know, uh, so 90, 90 or 99% of people are watching this 1% of highly unusual sort of probably out on the, you know, the, the, the tail end of multiple bell curves. Uh, mm-hmm. In terms of personality and disposition and curiosity and interest and, and narcissism and, you know, good and bad, mm-hmm. right? Uh, charisma as well and all these other kinds of things. Um, and and so we have this sort of mistaken view of, you know, the person who uh, uh, obtains sort of culturally elite status, however you, you know, however you define that, that is going to be a very unusual person. So one, one thing that I've tried to communicate in my writing is that, um, and Jordan makes this point, other people have made this point as well, is that for most people, you know, we, we've been taught, you know, especially by figures who have a lot of influence, that if you want to live a happy life, you have to be a, a rebel, you have to be unconventional, you have to take the road not traveled, you have to be, you know, some kind of a, an outlier, uh, a pathbreaker. And the thing is, you know, if you are, you know, an artist or a writer or an intellectual or whatever, a podcaster, something along these lines, that can work for you because you're highly psychologically atypical, mm-hmm. most likely. But for most people, their best shot at happiness is to actually follow a conventional path of, you know, stability and predictability and and finding romance and love and connection and just sort of following those uh, traditional milestones of, of a happy life. Mm. And that'll work for the, most people. It's not to say that if you follow those steps, you're guaranteed happiness, only that if you follow that sort of unconventional path, your chances of happiness are actually even slimmer. Uh, but the thing is, the the influential people who are unusual are trying to promote the same sort of values that they adhere to that can yes. often work for them, yeah. but it doesn't for everyone else. You know, when I look at, cause I, I took a rather unconventional path. I left my job, I went abroad, started an online business. And what there's been a shift though. At the beginning, I was evangelical. When I was uncertain of the path, I made, everybody had to know about it. They had to hear, you know, I had to talk to, knock. I was knocking on doors. Have you heard of the four hour work week? <laughs> you know, like handing <laughs> it to everybody. And uh, as I've, as it's worked, I 
find myself available to help, but not insistent upon helping. Yeah. And I, I do think that that is a marker of somebody with wisdom and a, like you can listen to this person is if they're shoving it down your throat, that's a compensation for a lack of security with their own choices and the way that they've made things happen. If they're yeah. available though, and you ask and they'll say, I'll, I'll open up, I'll share with you. That has proven to me to be, um, I don't know. I see it in myself. It's like, oh, and it's also just a litmus test for me to go, am I secure in this? Well, I'm telling everyone about it. So probably not. I'm probably trying to build, I'm trying to build consensus outside of myself so that I can quell the internal dissonance that I feel. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's been, that's been that's an such important a good point. thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've had, I've had the same, the same experience of, um, you know, like I've, I've gone through that, that, uh, uh, you know, the steps of trying to like foist advice upon people. Like, you know, I found the, the key, I found the path, mm -hmm. I found the thing that, that's helped me a lot. And then, yeah, be, yeah, become evangelical and start promoting it. And, and most people, you know, I, I find that most people are sort of most open to influence. If, if you take a sort of a light touch, if you, mm -hmm. you know, sort of maybe gently suggest once in a while, but don't foist it or, or just live your life and yeah. sort of your actions and your success speaks for itself. And then I've noticed like more recently in the last couple of years, especially that people are, are asking me now, like, you know, people who I wish I could have helped years ago, but mm -hmm. they weren't ready for it. Now they're coming to me and that's fine. Um, but yeah, that's something I, I learned the hard way is sort of foisting advice on people definitely does, does not work. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Have uh, I want to move to class now. So one question that I have when I read your work is I understand uh, you can rate people like on a spectrum of income or net worth, you know, zero to a ton. But that's different than class, as I understand it. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are different um, there are different components to to class. I mean, there's a lot of sort of interesting, like classic sociological research on on class. So, um, uh, so there's a, a French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who basically, uh, you know, he talked about this sort of triadic structure of of what class is: sort of education, income, and and cultural taste or habitus. He sometimes called it. Uh, Paul Fussell, who wrote a great book, it's a little bit date, dated. Uh, it was written in the 1980s, but it's it's still it's still funny and still really interesting. He sort of takes a sat satirical look at class in America. It's called Class: A Guide Through the American Status System, um, and he he writes the same thing that uh, the three components of class: uh, money, education, um, and 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 taste. Mm -hmm. And each class sort of has their own. Uh, uh, you, you can sort of determine someone's class based on which of those three components they think are important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he says, you know, for, for the lower classes, uh, they think of class as, as money. You know, you, if you have money, you have enough money, then you, you enter the upper classes. You know, that's what, that's what matters to them is, is how much money you have. And then, uh, Fussell suggests that for the middle class, um, money, money has some importance, but, but actually what's important is, is education. You know, mm -hmm. did you go to college or not? Uh, and that's sort of the marker of, you know, you've truly entered uh, sort of middle, especially upper middle class status. Um, and so this is why, for example, uh, in the U.S., we often think of uh, like a school teacher as being of higher social class than, say, uh, like a truck driver, despite the fact that often truck drivers actually earn more than school teachers. School teachers don't earn that mm. much, uh, but the school teacher has a degree. She went through ah. this sort of white collar training, that sort of occupation. Um, she, you know, work, working in a classroom or in an office, working indoors. So, so there's some interesting sort of uh, um, factors around your the specifics of your vocation, too. You know, Fussell makes this, you know, this kind of tongue-in-cheek joke in his book that the, the more likely you are to die, like the, the sort of the lower on the social class totem pole you are, no matter mm -hmm. how much you're getting paid. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then um, in, and in the upper classes, they think of, of taste. So it's not enough to, to have gone to the right school and earn money, but it's also, um, you know, your opinions and your habits and your customs. And you know, do you play this kind of sport? Do you consume this kind of media? Do you know how to talk about this issue? And so back in the mid 20th century, when Bourdieu was writing and, and when Fossil was writing too, it was like, you know, do you know how to communicate about art? Do you know how to communicate about wine? Uh, do you know how to, uh, you know, are, are you keeping up with the latest sort of, um, you know, expensive sporting events and these kinds of things? Are you going to the right events as well? You know, do you mm -hmm. have the money to attend these lavish um, formal events? Um, and so, so those are the three, those are the three components. And I think this actually helps to clarify a lot of you know, the confusion, uh, around class too, is, you know, we, in America, we, we often like to think that we, we don't have social class or it doesn't really matter. Mm. Or, you know, if you earn enough, then, then, you know, you, you can exit your social class. But if you win the lottery, you know, you don't suddenly enter the, the upper class. Mm -hmm. So, okay. A number of questions. Why, 
and maybe this is my narrow American view of it, why should we care about class? If, if, if I can win the lottery, the mega billions, and I got $900 million, I'm going to take the $400 million payout. You know, I'm great. Um, and I, and I've got a good life. Why should I be disappointed that I'm not in the upper class? Um, yeah, I don't necessarily think you should, you know, okay. it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, we have these terms, right? You know, upper, lower, middle, you know, I think like the, the terms inherently, I think can, can provoke hierarchy, uh, and, uh, yeah, irritation yeah, yeah. and yeah, the, because of the hierarchical implication, yeah. people get, get irritated by it. But, um, you know, it's not necessarily the case that people would, would want. I think we, we're sort of naturally drawn to this idea of rising in society. We like the idea mm -hmm. of upward social mobility and, and so on. And I think like, you know, a, a lot of people would, um, especially, you know, people who, who are born into poverty, uh, they would, you know, they would take the money over, you know, some kind of degree or, you know, knowing a lot about wine or something like yeah. those things are definitely unimportant, <laughs> but often what tends to happen, I think naturally in our lives, um, especially once we become comfortable is we do start to, um, you know, once, once your material needs are satisfied, then we start to want to, you know, join clubs and be around certain kinds of people and attend certain kinds of events and sort of be seen, as you said before. And and that starts to matter uh, more to people. I mean, I would love to look at like data on um, people who, who, who either are influencers or who aspire to be influencers. And my guess is that they probably didn't come from from particularly impoverished backgrounds, probably middle class or above most of mm -hmm. them, um, because, you know, when you're when you're struggling to make ends meet, um, you know, you, you know, you, you can't eat likes, you know what I mean? Yeah. You want money. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. But once you have that, then suddenly, you know, there, mm. it, it almost sort of follows that classic Maslow's hierarchy of needs okay. idea of like, you know, once you have those needs met, then you sort of want to want to go up and achieve that sort of self-actualization. And for a lot of people, that means status, right? Like yes. status becomes the, the thing that we're pursuing. Got it. Yeah. So when there's, when I read your takes on status and I go into it, I, I can't help but shake. One, I think you accurately point out how seemingly fundamental it is to human society. Like you put five people, they're going to sort of, they will, they will find a way to, to do status with each other. Uh, I, I hope that through material abundance and a bunch of meditation, people can supersede that. I'm curious what your perspectives are. Are we stuck with this status game? Is that just it, like part of being a primate or a human? Um, my, my, um, view is, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll never, we'll never fully escape it. I think we can be mindful and sort of poke fun at ourselves. Like we can, mm -hmm. like, even if you're one of those five people and the little game is mm -hmm. happening, I think you can sort of really sort of take a step back and recognize in your own mind, yeah. take that sort of metacognitive, like, oh, we're all playing a status game right yeah, now. Yeah. But, but you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to eject or, or, or that you no longer care about it. Right. Like you still mm -hmm. kind of want to. You know, in the same way that you can recognize what's going on when you, you know, find someone really beautiful or attractive, you can understand it in an intellectual sense. Yeah. But in the terms of like your emotional gut feeling, you're like, no, I still like really find this person attractive and I know what's what's happening to me uh, as a result mm -hmm. of it. Um, and so. So, yeah, the, I think status is uh, is fundamental. And th you know, this is like sort of well established by now in uh, the psychological literature that status, you know, by now is more or less universally agreed upon to be. A fundamental human motive it's sort of a it's an end in itself right this is sort of how um some some social psychologists have defined what is a fundamental motive meaning that we pursue it not in the service of something else but as an end in itself so so food is an interesting or, or an easy example here is you know we're not like food is pleasure like eating in itself is pleasurable it's yeah. not in the service of some other different sort of in, in a psychological sense like obviously yeah, yeah. in a biological sense you consume the food for the calories and the energy but in terms of the emotional, psychological experience of eating, we just like the food. We're not, there's no other reason other than that. And it's the same with status. We pursue status as an in itself, not necessarily because we're trying to get something else with the status. Um, and, you know, I've given, I've given these examples in, in, in some of the essays that I've written on my sub stack about, you know, people who will forego, uh, you know, higher paying jobs because yep. the current job they have is high status. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a story I tell of this uh, this lecturer that I knew at Yale, and uh, he got a job uh, at a Midwestern university. Uh, it was actually higher paying, a higher paying job. They offered him tenure, you know, all these perks. Um, and he was sort of in this sort of economically precarious position as a untenured sort of, um, I think, you know, he was on like a yearly contract in a lecturership position at Yale. And he turned down the offer for the tenure track job simply because of the name, you know, he, he enjoyed the status and the prestige of being associated with this name brand university. Now, again, my, my, my guess is, and this is the case for most academics, he probably came from a relatively affluent family and wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't going to in, in danger of starving. Probably if he was born into a different kind of circumstances, maybe more working class, he would have taken the job security and the money. 
But still, this is, I think this indicates something important that status is at least as important, you know, once your material needs are met, it's at least as important as money. Mm -hmm. I'm, when I look at my own life, I'm curious if, if you agree. Uh, I feel like a superpower of mine has been being able to walk away from status. So, you know, having the consulting job, leaving to go sleep on the floor and having that not psychologically destroy me as I did. I watched that destroy other people that I recommended it to. And it was, you know, I was like, oh, shit, this is not for everybody. Uh, but the ability to forego that incentive freed up so much latitude to do things that moved the ball in terms of my finances or my creativity or my getting to choose a career that was very much in line with what I wanted to do. It should, should everybody try to do that? Or is that just, I'm a weird aberration and I'm also, or maybe the other thing that I have to recognize is I'm not invited to like cool social clubs. I don't, I'm not, a, I'm only a tastemaker on my channel, but like I haven't, uh, Aside from this podcast, I'm not like in the intellectual elite by any means. And given the size of my one channel, which is fairly large, I've seen people with much larger followings wind up on Joe Rogan or these other things. Like there's there are these games that are being played that perhaps I'm missing out on. So I'm curious, like, is status a game worth playing or is that even a decent question? Um, well, it's, it, you know, so I think it depends on what your, what your aims are. So, you know, I think if your, if your ultimate aim is, is, you know, happiness, for example, if you want to be a happy person, I think the, you know, the pursuit of status will ultimately be futile. You maybe have these sort of short term boosts of enjoyment, mm -hmm. uh, that will quickly fade. Um, and so if you want to be just a happy, content, you know, satisfied person, probably not. Um, if you want, um, you know, if you have an important message you want to send, for example, mm -hmm. you know, you want to sort of increase your platform or something like that, uh, then, you know, there can be sort of avenues to obtaining, st you know, like you know, trying yeah. to whatever finagle your way, your way onto Joe Rogan or something like that can be useful. Yeah. Um, and I think in that, in that case, maybe, but, but even then, you know, it's not status. That's your ultimate goal. Yeah. It's getting an important message out there. That's the goal. Right. So I think even then actually, you know, status pursuit in itself is kind of a, you know, it's a mirage. And I think like, you know, we kind of recognize this even, you know, even as we look at our, at our own lives, I think for most people, the drive for status is sort of at its highest when you're, when you're young. And then you sort of, you, you play that game, you, you pursue it for a while. And then as you get older and a little wiser and, you know, maybe your testosterone levels drop and you, <laughs> you kind of step back and reflect a bit and you can think like, oh, or you recognize like, okay, maybe this isn't, uh, this isn't as, as enjoyable uh, yeah. as, as I thought it would be. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's, uh, and I think like also immersing yourself, I've noticed this with myself too. Yeah. You know, the more I read about it, the more I immerse myself in it, the more I study it, you know, I'm still, I, you know, I, I think it still influences me and I still think that it's something that I, you know, that, that plays some role in my behavior. But I think I, you know, at least I like to think that through studying it and recognizing it, it's, it's, it's power over me has, has yeah. weakened. Um, and I think that that can work. I think that can work for people. I like that a lot. Uh, the using status as a tool and not having it be what you describe for many people, it's an end in itself. And if you treat it as an end in itself, my experience has been that will be a mirage. It will be disappointing. You will feel hollow and empty and you will be in constant pursuit. But like you said, if you understand, look, if I wear a suit, I, I can communicate with a particular type of person in a particular way. If I wear my hoodie, that's going to communicate a different thing. And if you understand these dynamics, it's just more colors on your palette or words in your vocabulary in order to use. But yeah, it, to get lost in it seems, at least in my experience, to be uh, kind of a fool's errand. Yeah, I mean, there are individual differences in, in status pursuit too. You know, so so it is a it's a fundamental pursuit. So I, I wrote this uh, this this essay on my Substack post um, based on a, on a lecture. Um, I delivered on status and it, I, you can think of it again, like sort of returning to that food analogy of like, you know, everyone, everyone needs food, everyone craves food, but there we are, the frequency of our desire for food and the intensity of our hunger varies from person to person. And mm -hmm. I think it's the same for status that some of us, you know, we, we like status, but you know, we can do with a little bit of it and that's enough for us and we can kind of move on with our lives and other people, it becomes this all consuming thing, um, that will sort of go to great lengths to, to pursue. And so there is variation, and I think we can, to some extent, exert control over it in the same way that you can sort of exert control over your, um, you know, your your hunger and your appetite, and mm -hmm. and, uh, and recognize like you know, oh, maybe having the chocolate cake isn't the best thing for me as much as I might like it. You can sort of do the same thing for for status as well. Yeah, and I guess that's that status is probably why people post that when they're, they're happy when they're not happy because it increases their status, yeah. and that's great, interesting. So <laughs> yeah, 
I want to, you've had experience in, I suppose, lower class, middle class, upper class settings. I, I have not had nearly the breadth of experience that you had. But one book that was very powerful for me was a book called Millionaire Fastlane. And it talked about the beliefs that uh, low class, middle class, and upper class people have around money. There were some big ones for me that in the low class, debt is for buying stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like get money, spend money. Uh, like don't save at all. Then you go to the middle class and they're looking to the left and they go save, save, save. Debt is bad. Get rid of your debt. You know, don't have it. And it's about um, your income is fixed. So it's about being economical with the way you spend. And then you get to the upper class and it's debt is used to buy assets. That is wonderful if it's spent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm going to play these financial games that I that I haven't totally you know sunk into this world yet. Um, forget about the outflows because you can open up your revenue, your top line, you can transform. You can 10X your income if you own your own business, but you can't 10X your income if you're a school teacher. So like rather than rather than skimping on lattes, which is what a middle class, you know, be careful. What are you eating out? Make a budget. Upper class person says, buy as many fucking lattes as you want. What you need to do is uncap your income. You need to uncap that. And then the truly upper classes, forget about income. It's all about net worth because we're going to borrow debt against the net worth that we have. And we're going to, you know, play all these tax games in order to, you know, to just live off of the value of our net worth in terms of debt we take from the bank. So that was very sure. useful for me. It actually helped me move from a middle class mentality where I grew up into you know, a more entrepreneurial upper class and help me make money by not focusing on what was being spent, but what was being earned. I'm curious if you could, what sort of beliefs did you see at these different stations of your life? And yeah. you talk, I, I, we can get to luxury beliefs, which are the idea that there's these upper class beliefs that hurt the lower class. But I'm also interested in like, what are the lower class beliefs that hurt the lower class? Like what are, what are the, what are the middle class beliefs that keep them stuck there? I, and so this might be a longer, uh, wider opening to, to chat about these sorts of beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, so lower class, well, I mean, definitely. So you, yeah, through your description of that book, you definitely hit on something there with, um, sort of a poor working class people, people on the sort of lower, uh, end of the socioeconomic spectrum. It is like much more about sort of money and material goods. And, you know, like I, so I worked at a, um, at a restaurant when I was a teenager, when I was in high school, I, you know, I, um, washed the dishes and I, you know, talked to the pizza makers and the cooks and all the guys in the back. And yeah, it was about, you know, w you know, what you're going to spend your paycheck on next. It was sort of living for tomorrow. It was a very sort of short term mm -hmm. thinking, high time preference. Just what are you going to do when Friday's paycheck rolls around and then yeah. they just sort of drink it away or spend frivolously. And then Monday comes around and they sort of back at square one. And then, you know, talking again, what are you going to do Friday? You know, it's sort of that a perpetual cycle of sort of mm. short term earning, short term spending and and not really thinking about, uh, you know, the, the longer term. And then, you know, in terms of like, you know, what what would you do? You know, so that we you know, have these sort of uh, hypothetical sort of fantasy conversations. What would you do if you won the lottery or what would you do if, you know, you whatever you discovered, you know, you had a dead uncle who gave you a million dollars. What would happen? You know, what would you do with it? And yeah, it was like. Uh, not really investing in yourself or collecting <laughs> assets or anything like that. It was like, you know, I'd, I'd buy a Lamborghini Spend or I'd it buy all. a boat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'd buy a boat or I'd buy a big house or I'd just quit and, uh, you know, whatever, just go on vacation forever. Um, and it wasn't really sort of thinking carefully about, you know, well, you know, I, I, maybe I'd go to college, maybe yeah. I'd get an education and invest in myself and can I, can I chime in here? some new skills. You're yeah. making me realize something, which is it, it's about time horizon. Like the lower class people are about the week or the month. Middle class is about the month or maybe a couple of years. Upper class is decades of building a business. And then super wealthy is generational. It's like, yeah. how do I steward this tremendous amount of wealth? And it's, yeah, what kind of decisions will you make if you have a very short time horizon? Well, to have a very good Friday, <laughs> you know what I mean? Monday be damned. And yeah. it's, yes, being able to open up your time horizon seems to be part of the key to, if you're interested in moving upward in this, that would be tremendously impactful. Yeah, 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 to sort of think ahead. And I remember having those thoughts to myself when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old. And, you know, for whatever reason, I, I would think ahead and 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 I would, you know, because I'd, I'd work with guys who were maybe 10, 15 years older than me. And I was like, is this where I want to be in 10 mm -hmm. years? Like, I don't want to be 27 working at a, at a pizza joint, you know, like I, I, I don't know where I want to be, but definitely not here. Um, and so, yeah, sort of thinking ahead and that's, yeah, I think that's characteristic of, of, of different classes as well. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, so yeah, that's interesting. Like that, that, um, that debt, what you said about, you know, sort of lower class, upper class that they sort of 
have this, you know, uh, uh, less anxious relationship around debt. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, this is like, this reminds me, you know, like there's this whole idea of like, you know, how the rich and the poor have more common with one another than either one of them do with the middle class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, you can think about this with like, like jobs too, right? Like if you have three or four jobs, um, so, so like middle class people, they work one job, right? They usually work a nine to five. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you have three or four jobs, it's you know, chances are you're either working like multiple low wage gigs to make ends meet. Or, you know, you're you're like a mogul or a celebrity or, you know, some kind of a, a, you know, a writer or a critic or something. You're, you're sitting on the board of multiple companies. You you have a podcast and you have this. Yeah. You have multiple different, you're wearing different hats. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I think there's, that, that's an interesting point there too, that um, we sort of look at it in in, 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 in similar, but, but also different ways. Yes. So luxury beliefs, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this because I thought, uh, this is actually the first time I heard of you was, I don't know how long ago it was, but it was when luxury beliefs sort of exploded onto the scene in the podcast world, probably some of the, the earlier ones that you did. Um, I was struck by them. So I'll let you, you know, I teed you up, talk a bit about luxury beliefs. Luxury beliefs, I coined this idea back in 2019. Um, you know, the well, the, the seed of the idea was actually planted earlier than that, but that was when I started writing publicly about it and just decided, you know what, I've been thinking about this for a while. And, you know, 2019 was when I finally had the term right. The idea was there from the beginning, but I just didn't know what to call it. But um, I gave it this name, luxury beliefs, ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while often inflicting costs Mm -hmm. on the lower classes. And there are multiple components to this idea. Um, Essentially, you know, so so historically, and we've talked about this a bit in our conversation here, is the upper classes have historically demonstrated their wealth, um, at least in part, through sort of ostentatious material displays or exhibition. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, you know, there's, there's a classic book on class uh, from Thorsten Babelin. He was an economist and sociologist in the late 19th century. He wrote this book, The Theory of the Leisure Class. And in that book, he talked about how, you know, that in his day, uh, you know, the aristocrats, the upper classes that displayed their wealth through uh, expensive tuxedos and evening ga- gowns and top hats and pocket watches, monocles. And a hundred years ago, it was very clear, you know, walking around uh, uh, American society, who was rich and who was poor. You could immediately tell just by the way they were dressed, the way they carried themselves. Um, where they lived and so on. Um, and so that was the way they did it. My claim is that today, um, the upper classes, they still exist. Uh, it's a bit less, um, it's a bit less sort of, uh, uh, admirable say to display your wealth through material Mm -hmm. goods. That's not to say that people don't do it, but I would say today that material goods have become a noisier signal of Mm -hmm. one's social class and social status today. Um, and so the way today that many members, not all, but many members of sort of the upper and the upper middle classes display their status is through their beliefs, through luxury beliefs rather than luxury goods. And there's, you know, we've been talking about the the intensity of the desire for status. There's two recent papers published, one in 2019 and one 2020, which basically found that the uh, most affluent and most educated members of society are the ones who have the strongest desire for status. Which is maybe, in some ways, it's almost counterintuitive. You might think that it's people at the bottom of society who don't have much money, who don't have much wealth um, or poor status. They would be the ones who would have the strongest craving for wealth and status. But it's actually not true. It's actually people who are at or near the top of the ladder who want to maintain their status and who want even more of it. Um, And so there's this strong, intense desire. And so now they do it with peculiar ideas, novel opinions, sort of going against the grain, unconventional views. And... This can make you look like an interesting, unique, compelling person. Um, it's very clear, you know, if you express one of these views that you're a member of this rarefied um, strata of society, you listen to the right podcasts, you read the right books, you, um, you know, subscribe to the right media channels, and you're uh, sort of repeating these high status ideas. But often, uh, if those ideas sort of percolate throughout society, either through policy or through just sort of broad mm-hmm. cultural social influence, and the way that it can kind of change people's behavior over time, they actually have detrimental effects for everyone else. <laughs> yeah. So I was I couldn't help but think of the peacock when I was reading this and the idea that, you know, the peacock has how does it show its its power, its status? It has all of these feathers. It wastes calories on these on this plumage that doesn't help it escape predators. What do humans do? We buy Rolexes that are a waste yeah. of resources. And then at the top level, we have these beliefs that in many cases are wastes of resources. And we signal that we don't need 
healthy beliefs in order to survive. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the They're signal. Handicapping. Defund the police. Not a problem for my private, you know, security team that yeah. goes around. Like, there's a lot of these yeah. ideas that are like, this wouldn't survive contact with ground reality, and that's how I know that you are so freaking rich and wealthy yeah. in it. And it's yeah. uh, it occurred to me like, oh my god, in some way, some of these beliefs are designed to not work <laughs> because if they <laughs> if they worked the lower class would have them because they would work and they would need those beliefs so in order to go against that you have to pick the belief that doesn't survive contact with you know what it is like to be in the poor or middle class neighborhood yeah 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 there's this there's this saying i learned from uh, one of my history professors that uh you know common sense is like air that the higher up you go the thinner it gets <laughs> and sort of the, the 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 further away you get from reality yeah uh the more likely you are to express views that are sort of disconnected from the realities of of, of sort of day-to-day -day life and so yeah mm -hmm. but defund the it's so you know i mentioned i i, I coined this term in 2019 you know i would have never guessed you know if you gave me a bunch of different examples you know, I would have never guessed that defund the police was about to take off and become mm -hmm. sort of this prominent cultural touch point of, you know, many, many members of, uh, of the upper class, the upper middle class, uh, that this was going to be taken seriously as an idea. And in some, some places it was, you know, explicitly implemented in a policy and then just generally sort of through the, um, uh, derisive attitudes around policing and just sort of naturally had this effect that a lot of a lot of police officers retired or they quit and now they're having difficulty recruiting. Mm -hmm. And so you just sort of cultivate this hostile attitude around police. And of course, like, you know, we saw a lot of violent crime skyrocket in a lot of major cities in the US, homicide rates increased. Um, I think like a lot of a lot of the energy and misguided understanding and I think some of it was 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 Probably a minority of people who held the view were, uh, you know, maybe uh, malicious. But I think most people were just naive and they didn't understand what was going on. The reality, mm -hmm. which is that it's true that a disproportionate number of criminals are uh, poor or grew up poor, but so are their victims. You know, mm -hmm. most poor people who are criminals target other poor people because that's who's around them. Mm -hmm. And so, because there are many more, t there are many times more victims than there are perpetrators. To not, uh, you know, to not uh, 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 prosecute criminals is to actually uh, harm the poor. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's there was a, a fascinating study. Um, can't remember the year it came out, but essentially the finding, the key finding, was that one percent of the population is responsible for more than sixty percent of the violent crime. Wow. And so, you know, it's just a minority of people who who tend to 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 um, commit criminal offenses. And they tend to do it to more than one person. So it's actually you know, many times more poor people who are victimized. And so there's you know, research that I've reported in some of my writing indicating that um, relative to Americans who earn more than $75,000 a year, the poorest Americans are seven times more likely to be victims of aggravated assault, seven times more likely to be victims of robbery, 20 times more likely to be victims of sexual assault, and on and on. I mean, basically every single crime you can, you can imagine but I think that a lot of the luxury belief class, they have a misunderstanding of, of poverty because the only times that they ever sort of witness poverty or have any contact with it is through the sort of criminal justice system. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, you might, you know, the, the reports of, you know, criminals being uh, sent to prison or, or maybe through, through fictional portrayals of, of, of poverty too. And because criminality is kind of interesting and it's kind of glamorized to some extent that people have a misunderstanding of the fact that the vast majority of poor people never commit crimes, but it's not interesting to make a TV show about, you know, some poor guy who makes, you know, $13 an hour, clocks in, clocks out, follows the law, goes home, takes care of his kids and goes mm -hmm. to bed. You know, that's not an interesting story. The interesting story is like, oh, there's a school teacher who's barely making ends meet and he decides to break bad by selling math and becoming a criminal. Like, yeah. That's yeah. more fun and interesting to watch. Ah. And so, so, so. Then so there's the the criminal component. So then they see you know, people who are locked up or sent off to prison or whatever, but they're not seeing um, you know the, the the vast majority of people. They're not seeing the the criminals victims or the the neighborhood that he came from where most people aren't committing crimes. And so there's just this misunderstanding, and it's almost offensive to say like conflating crime with poverty when most poor people actually aren't aren't committing crimes at all. Mm. Have you looked specifically at data around defund the police? I'm curious if there's like cities that did it more or less and if there was an outcome, because I hear you in that, okay, 
we want to protect the like the poor the poorer people are more likely to be the victims of violent crime does it follow that defunding the police increases or decreases that likelihood i'm curious if you've seen any data around that yeah, I have seen it. I, I don't recall the specific numbers on this, but like if you look at um, like San Francisco, for example, uh, you know the victims of, of violent crime have increased over time as they, you know, they, I think they 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 they're they're shifting away from the defund policies, but they did implement some of these. I don't know to what extent, but they decriminalized shoplifting. There was just sort of a general sort of relaxed permissive attitude around policing in San Francisco starting in 2020. And yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a skyrocketing in, in all kinds of crimes. And yeah, I mean, it's funny. There was a earlier, earlier this year, there was a tech entrepreneur who was murdered uh, in San Francisco. And, yeah. and this was reported by like all of the media. And it was like, it's so interesting because like homicides have been increasing in that city for three years now, but it's only when one of their own, one of their own people is killed that suddenly it becomes a problem. Mm. And that was actually, uh, I think, uh, one of the turning points for San Francisco for the, the mayor to suddenly say, like, oh, we need to have policing again and we need to start enforcing the law wow. again. Um, and it's it, it wasn't explicit, right? They didn't okay, say, oh, sure. because the tech entrepreneur was killed. But, you know, the timing was very coincidental that suddenly once that occurred, you know, they, they began to take policing more seriously. So. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, again, no, no hard numbers on this, but like. I, I have read multiple reports of, of, of crime increasing as a result of uh, these defund policies. Yeah. I, uh, other ones that came up for me and I'm not uh, like anti-vaxxer or, or any, like anything. Uh, I would say I don't have pretty extreme beliefs about COVID, but I was living in downtown Santa Monica in a nice area. And when they did the shutdown, I was like, oh, this fucking is just terrible. Like all of the businesses yeah. are shut down. There's nowhere for that I can exercise. They shut down all of the parks. They shut down anything that you could do a pull up on. It was um, for a period of time. There was it was you were locked in my tiny apartment. And then Gavin Newsom, who was, you know, wearing his mask and all the TV press conferences is seen at the French Laundry having a wonderful dinner out in Napa Valley. And it, I felt this, you know, at someone living in it, like a more inner city area. I was like, oh, very easy for all of these politicians to, to demand that everyone else shut down and return to their tiny little hovel and, sh- you know, lock all the parks and lock all the things for safety while they take all these brownie points. And then some of the, you know, things that were being said about people with my view, which was, hey, we don't necessarily need this for young people. Maybe the old was you don't care about human life. Da 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 da. And it's like, wow, like I'm not even me, because I, I was healthy, I have an online business, but think of the small business owner that owns a family restaurant. Like they're shouldering all of the burden of this shutdown, getting some checks in the mail in order to cover it. Many of those businesses in downtown Santa Monica have never come back, they're still shut down. Yeah. And uh, well, Gavin Newsom got a slap on the wrist for having that dinner that night and learned to do it more privately. And even if he didn't go out, he still had fucking barbecues in his backyard whenever the heck, whenever he needed to. Uh, so yeah, I, I, yeah. I that, that one occurred to me as a strong one uh for yeah. for that where i was too i mean when schools were shut down right i mean it's you know a lot of like if you're from you know relatively affluent background you know you can do online schooling you know your kid has his own room you, know, you can get get online tutors you can catch up i mean yeah this is you know this has been another sort of side effect of the pandemic is like a lot of a lot of poor kids uh, fell way behind in their schooling sort of the the achievement gaps have increased mm. uh by 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 um by income by social class uh and a lot of that was, was, was due to COVID. Since wow. COVID, since the lockdowns. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of those kids, you know, they, they have no, over, like, you know, it's one thing if you have, you know, a couple of parents and, you know, you have they have their own room and you're sort of being monitored and everything. Yeah. It's another if, like, you know, you have one parent and multiple kids, maybe they're stacked on top of each other in the same bedroom. Like most, you know, a lot of a lot of poor kids, you know, they should, they bunk up, they have multiple, you know, and so it's, it's harder. They don't have the space for it. Um, and so, so yeah, a lot of those kids ended up falling behind, uh, even more than they already were, right? The achievement mm. gaps have always been present, but they, they were, were magnified as a result of the lockdowns. And so, yeah, I think by, by 2021, I thought it was pretty clear that like, this wasn't really a, the most serious, it wasn't a particularly serious illness for, for children, for young people. And yet a lot of these schools remained closed in, in California. I, I heard about this, you know, they were, they were closed for a very long time. And, uh, and yeah, like no one really seemed to, to be particularly upset about it, at least, at least in the media and the people who are the tastemakers and the people who shape and influence policy, mm-hmm. the schools were shut. And, and we're, you're sort of seeing the sort of mea culpa now where a lot of people are sort of, oh, in hindsight, maybe we mm-hmm. sort of exaggerated or took it too far. But, you know, that's not going to make up for, you know, all of the, the people who suffered in, 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 during that, during that period. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, there's another one that I that I've uh, read you talking about is the promiscuity, and so these the first the first ones, and you know, out of wedlock. The first ones I understand. There's policies that drive those that we talked about. There's a COVID lockdown, right? How does this idea of uh, you don't need to be married move from the elite down to these other lower social classes? Because if you don't have to be married and you're in the elite class, well, one, it sounds like they're still getting married all the time, as you point out, right? Some of these feminist ideas of of separation, uh, not feminist, maybe it's third wave feminism. Um, but what you see is that they're being, well, I'm going to stop here. Is it true that that idea started in the elite and funneled its way down? Do we have evidence for that? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so again, so I, I mentioned in 1960 how the families were roughly similar in terms mm-hmm. of their stability and um, and how they were largely intact. Uh, and then the fashionable ideas emerged around, uh, you know, monogamy and 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 marriage being outdated and no longer being necessary. And these ideas were promulgated by, you know, they started in universities and then sort of escaped into academia and the media at large. And then it um, infiltrated sort of pop culture and the music and the movies and the TV shows and everywhere. And and gradually over time, um, and then, then, yeah, sort of, it did, it sort of indirectly influenced social policy with no fault divorce laws. And through sort of subsidizing uh, families, uh, fatherless families, and so on. And so, interestingly, there was this period in the 1970s where there was a a dip in uh, out-of-wedlock birth rates and um, among the upper classes. It never dropped as far as it did for the lower classes, but there was a sort of a prolonged dip in the 70s, and then by the 80s it had recovered. Mm -hmm. Um, And what seems to have happened there is that the upper classes, for, for a moment, you know, maybe a period of a decade or so, they actually did sort of uh, uh, practice what they preached uh, and then sort of recognize like, oh, this is really bad. Like, you know, it's not good for my kids. It's not good for myself, my family, whatever, my partner. And then they sort of went back to those old school sort of traditional values um, and got married and so on. And and they sort of continue that today um, by and large. Uh, And then for the lower classes, they also took that penalty. You know, the 60s into the 70s, there was that massive dec- decrease in number of children raised by both of their birth parents, and then they just never recovered. It sort of continued to plummet ever since. So there was that interesting period where the, the upper classes were doing the same thing and promoting it and broadcasting it and saying, this is the right way to live, sexual freedom and fun. And then today, you know, it's sort of taken on these interesting um, interesting manifestations. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've written about a, a friend of mine who told me, uh, so he was a grad student, and he said that when he put his, um, I don't know what app it was, Bumble or something, his radius uh, for his dating app around the university, it was like one mile around the university. And it was the the, the women's profiles he was seeing, uh, they were all students uh, at the university, essentially, almost all of them. And he said, you know, when he'd read their little bios, it would say, you know, he'd said something like, like half of them, probably slight exaggeration, but he said like half of them would have something like, you know, keeping a casual or, 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 you know, open to poly or, you know, basically indicating like, you know, they were pro-sexual freedom and, and, uh, and, and they were, they were happy to broadcast this. And so then he said when he extended the dating app radius to five miles to the outskirt of the university, um, which is a sort of more working class blue collar area, more rundown, it was the same age range. I don't know what it was, 18 to 24 year old women. And he said, um, you know, when he, when he extended the radius, about half of the women were single moms. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, my claim is essentially that the luxury beliefs of the former group, not just the women, but the men too, uh, have gradually affected, uh, the latter group where sexual freedom and promiscuity and openness, it looks very different if you're 22 years old on a college campus versus if you're 22 years old and you live in a sort of rundown blue collar area where there aren't that many opportunities and, you know, you yourself were maybe not raised by both of your parents. And, you know, you can actually sort of see this. And, um, you know, I've, I've written about dating apps, and all these kinds of things, too, that, you know, if you ask women um, about their experiences on the dating apps and you break it down by education, women who have college degrees are much more likely to report or much less likely to report relative to women with high school diploma only. Um, you know, basically less educated women are more likely to say that they've been harassed or stalked or mistreated in some way from someone they met on a dating app. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just that your your pool looks different. Your dating pool looks different. 
um, it's fun to sort of play around with cultural norms and expectations and um, sort of the the cultural script around dating when you're educated and affluent and you have options and you have a safety net. But when you're poor and you're sort of living on the margins of society, and you're struggling to get by and you don't have those guardrails, um, freedom looks very different. It often looks like, you know, emotional or physical abuse, or it looks like, um, you know, sort of out of woodlot births and lots mm. of kids who don't have their parents. And it just looks, um, you know, it looks, it looks different. Yeah. What I'm taking from this is uh, when I live my life and give advice to be extremely cognizant of the context that I live in. Because even in that story, I'm not hearing that the 22 year olds on the college campus are necessarily miserable, unhappy. You know, there's any particular problem with that in that context. The problem comes when you believe that the way that works for you is going can be separated from the context in which you live, codified in law and applied to everybody (laughs) evenly. Or even when you start writing articles that say, here is the access to the best way, even even that it's not necessarily violent, but that it, it lacks an understanding that things work in a particular cultural context. And yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know that the elites are evil or wrong in this particular case at all. It's just, this works for you. And if other people copy you, it's not going to go well for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think historically elites had some understanding of this that like, you know, you, there was an element of hypocrisy that went along with that kind of noblesse oblige of like, you know, here's the best way to live on average for most people. And Maybe in their private, you know, maybe in their private lives, they would cheat on their spouse or do drugs or whatever, but they still tried Mm -hmm. to uphold the ideal of, Mm. you know, having a stable marriage and trying to like live a clean and healthy life. Like that's the way to go. And then privately, maybe they would sort of fall short of it. Whereas today, somehow hypocrisy has become one of the ultimate transgressions. You know, it's the thing you don't want to, you know, being a hypocrite is so bad. And so it's better to just cheat on your spouse and own it and say, yeah, I cheat, but at least I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not going to lie to you about it. Yeah, this is who I am. And I think that can have an effect on people too, of um, sort of the example that it can set. And yeah, I mean, uh, pe- people are different, right? In terms of their economic, social, cognitive, material resources that if you're you know, a rich college kid, you can probably do some Coke on the weekends and in all likelihood, you'll probably mm. be okay. But if you're an 18 year old kid in a rundown neighborhood with no adult supervision or oversight or guidance and you try that hit of meth, there's a good chance that's gonna lead you on a path to self-destruction, right? Like drug. Uh, you know, sort of the the permissive attitudes around drug use look very different depending on on the, on the context and the environment. And so, yeah, this is something that uh, that I think like a lot of people uh, who are um, you know sort of in positions of influence uh, in in the upper classes, um, they do hold some degree of of responsibility mm-hmm. simply because you know to return it back to that status point, um, you know, two of the strongest predictors of whether someone will. Um, uh, sort of be open to persuasion and to to sh- changing their behavior and their opinions and their mindset. So one is uh, if the model they're looking at is a high status person, and then the other is if everyone around them is doing the same thing. And so if you're a high status person, uh, whether that means sort of having a large platform or just sort of being uh, culturally recognized as being a member of the sort of uh, elite or what have you, uh, you have some responsibility to like you know, set a, set a decent example, even if you know, you yourself to always live by it, Mm -hmm. to at least have the ideal. Um, and yeah, I think like the, that, that shift from like hypocrisy being the worst thing, I think that was actually a mistake. Yeah. There's, I mean, you just made me realize the, I, again, I'm not encouraging hypocrisy, but I think it should be transcended and you could be the exemplar at a higher level, but given that people are often imperfect, that there is a light side of hypocrisy, which is the recognition that I am constantly setting an example. And though I may fall short of it, this is probably not why people are often hypocrites, but yeah. that, there, that there can be nobility in hypocrisy, though I do think ideally you would have someone who could transcend hypocrisy and would be, you know, I don't need to do cocaine, even though I'm rich because, you know, I've, <laughs> I like and then and then be a hypocrite about it. I can, you know, I can be better than yeah. that. Interesting. Yeah. Very yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can you can have the ideal and recognize, yeah, I don't always, you know, live up to it, but it is mm. something that we should all strive toward versus just like openly um, doing things that are maybe bad for you and bad for the people around you. I mean, yeah, and I think like, yeah, people just have this um, you know, so I, I had this, this is making me think of a conversation I had a few weeks ago with this this pretty well well known philosopher. Um, you know, we you know, talking about the defund the police thing and, and so he was like, you know, Rob, like 
I used to think that defund the police was stupid. And now I'm thinking like, you know what, if that's what some of these communities want to do, if they want to defund the police, that's fine. And I said, well, it's not everyone. Like it's a small group of people yeah. who have some disproportionate amount of influence. And then he said, yeah, but the people around them shouldn't be voting for it then, or they should be vo you know, voting for different people, different politicians. Um, so in a way they're bringing it on themselves. And then I said, I mean, may maybe that's the case, but then the people who will be, um, sort of at risk as a result of this, who will suffer for it, uh, you know, a lot of them are going to be young children, right? And kids can't vote, right? So, you know, no matter how you want to, you know, discuss this or who you want to blame or, you know, fault, you know, ultimately kids are going to be um, some of the most sort of vulnerable people for, for all of this, whether it's sexual promiscuity or drug use or defunding the police and so on, you know, I, I spend a good portion of my you know, the lockdown, writing my book and sort of reimagining and recapturing and, re you know, recalling what it was like to be a kid again. Mm -hmm. And just that sort of sense of helplessness as adults are making all these decisions for you. And, uh, and yeah, it's just, I think like as adults, we sort of forget about that, that, um, we think about, you know, especially when we get into these sort of cultural, uh, uh battles and these culture wars and all these things, we're thinking about the other side, these, this group, that group needs to suffer. This group is doing the right mm -hmm. thing. And we're not really thinking about the people who are really suffering from this. Yes, poor people are suffering. People who are sort of marginalized are suffering. But really, um, the kids in those environments are the ones who are suffering the most, and they have no control over you know the direction of their lives. And they're yeah, they're they're often uh, victimized by this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not noble to merely say, "Oh, fuck it," if they want to burn it down, burn it down. Because like, well, they aren't. Uh, they are not yeah. a uniformity. They are not one hundred percent. They are not making decisions yeah. merely for themselves. They are making it for children and other members of their community. I, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's worth worth pushing against. I wanna ask you about class warfare, um, how you conceive yeah. of it. I imagine it's not like Karl Marx where it's every class you know, versus <laughs> every class. Does Is it real? Does it occur? Um, some of what we talked about was like inner class warfare of the poor on poor. So is that something that you've thought about? Does it exist or is it just a um, unfortunate happenstance of different incentives that are well i guess that could still be class warfare yeah well i think yeah most of the most of the kind of warfare is is intra-class within mm -hmm. class so so sort of poor on rich on rich you know like uh peter turchin he's um uh you written, written this book recently uh, i think his he's trained i think a mathematical biologist i hope i'm getting that right but he's written about this idea of intra-elite conflict that a lot of sort of the 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 uh, disputes and battles that we see that play out on the media and in, in, in online and everything. A lot of this is intra elite conflict and sort of the elites on both political parties, you know, co uh, uh, combating one another. Um, and then even within the the, the parties themselves, um, mm -hmm. they're they're sort of combating one another. There's sort of generational churn and so on. But but um, in terms of like you know uh, working class versus upper class, and I think there's there's a bit of that. I think there's um, sort of a, a a kind of a resentment on on both sides um i think for some members you know this is speaking in generalities this isn't the case in every you know for every person but i think for a lot of sort of middle upper middle class people probably less so upper class people because they're sort of so far removed from it is there's this sort of fear of downward mobility of sort of slipping down and so i think they adopt this attitude of like resentment or or um uh, this sort of conceited arrogance of like, oh, these working class and these poor people, like, you know, they're uneducated and they're backward and so on. And I think part of that is like this fear of like, you know, if, if they don't do everything right for their kids, their kids might slip down a rung and actually end up there. And so they're trying their mm. very hardest to sort of distance themselves from it and to sort of highlight that, that, that boundary that, you know, to demarcate, like, we're definitely not like them. And then I think, uh, a lot of sort of working class and poor people can sense that and, um, and feel like, you know, on the one hand, sort of put upon or beleaguered that, you know, they haven't been able to do as well as they wanted to and haven't been able to climb up. And so they sort of feel this resentment and maybe a bit of envy towards people who are doing well in their lives. And yeah, I think like you can, you can kind of see this. I mean, you know, when I, when I think about some of my friends that I grew up with, one thing that I'm, I'm careful to do is to like, not really talk about my like personal success or anything like yeah. that, or like the direction that my life has gone. I just don't, I don't even bring it up. Sometimes they'll tease me for it and I just play along with it. But I, I definitely, um, you know, I don't, uh, I, I try to avoid any kind of like anything that might look like I'm bragging because, you know, mm -hmm. I don't, I just don't want to, 
make them feel a certain way because they made different life choices than me. Now, if they come to me and ask me for advice, I'm happy to give it, but I do sort of sense it. Um, you know, I, I remember, um, I was, I was at a casino a few years ago with my uh, younger sister, uh, where we grew up, um, near, near Red, we were actually in Corning. I don't know if you, I know you're in California. I don't know if you know nah, where Corning never, is. It's no, way, way up north. <laughs> it's up in the sticks, man. Okay. Um, and we were at this casino and, uh, somehow this was, this was back when I was still in college and, you know, my sister told the dealer like, oh, it's my brother, you know, he's off college and he's doing really well. And, uh, and the, the dealer was like, yeah, you got out of here, man. He's like, what are you doing here? Like, why would you be sitting here playing cards? And I'm like, like, why not? Like, you know, like I hadn't yet like figured out what was going on in terms of class. I hadn't studied it that deeply yet. Yeah. And, you know, for him, it was like, you know, if you get out of here and you're doing well in your life, like, why would you, you know, why would you come back to a place like this? And, um, and yeah, I didn't really get that mindset in, in, until later that there is that feeling of like, um, I don't know, being left behind or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I think like, yeah, we, cause that was, that was 2015 when that happened. And so, yeah, a year later, you know, with, with the election and all the political stuff, we sort of saw that play out just, you know, how, how, um, deep those, those divisions are. And, and then I think a lot of it is, is about class rather than politics too, because I think there's a lot of, there's a gap too, between, you know, even within the political parties, like working class Democrats versus elite Democrats and so on, that, uh, there is a sort of a class, class war is just as sort of just as contentious as, as the, the sort of the political battles. Mm-hmm. In so uh, we've we've talked a lot about and it's sort of an analysis of what's going on, and I think it's it's uh, incisive in a lot of ways. One of the outstanding questions that I have is, what do we do? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. how do how do we handle this? So uh, for one thing that I'll repeat that I am taking from this is to be more cognizant of the context in which my life has occurred, and the space in which my advice is likely to be helpful, and the space in which I might need to go. You know what? I'm not sure. Like, you know, doing it the way that I did might not work here. And uh, because I haven't I haven't lived that. Does that imply a more uh, local government would be more successful for helping people? Like, given everything that we've done and sort of talked about today, I'm curious if you have either broad political or cultural or personal recommendations that people can do. I'll say the personal ones that I heard was find a mentee, find a mentor, speak to people that are 10 years in either direction of you. And that that's deeply meaningful. From a cultural or political, do you have um, causes or, or uh, ideas that you want to see promulgated? Um, I mean, so cultural or, I mean, I, I think all the things that you just mentioned are important. One of the other things is like, if you're a mentor of someone who's younger than you, I think a lot of us feel um, the sense of like, are we doing enough? Uh, are we on the right path? Mm-hmm. But one of the one of the sort of unexpected um uh, insights that I had through, through mentoring young people is like when you talk to young people and, and you actually recognize just how far you've come, you know, there's a, there's a huge difference say between being, Mm -hmm. you know, 20 versus 30, right. Just like, and you you don't think about that day to day. You're just thinking about like, am I doing enough? Like you think about all your shortcomings and inadequacies, but when you talk to someone who's younger, who is even further behind in their journey and you help them along, you recognize like, Oh, like I've actually done quite a bit. And so you sort of restores a bit of that, that, um, uh, confidence. But in terms of other other things, I mean, I think, yeah, being mindful of, you know, the role that you play in society, that there are people who, who are going to listen to you. Um, and yeah, what what else? I mean, yeah, the second order consequences of, of your beliefs and your ideas. Mm-hmm. And uh, and yeah, I think I think you yeah, you covered it pretty well. Cool. Do you have political aspirations? I mean, you have uh, you, <laughs> I actually think you have a, a really the pedigree for it at this point. Uh, no, no, uh, no <laughs> political aspirations whatsoever. You know, it's so funny, man. Like I had this conversation, um, this was like a few months ago, uh, with this guy who had a very successful, uh, medical career and then a very successful media career. And now he's thinking of politics. He doesn't want to do it, but he's sort of dabbling in it or thinking about it because he thinks that things are going really bad in his state. And he's telling, you know, people around him are basically saying it's your duty, right? Like mm. you have achieved, like you've already reached the peak of, you know, multiple different, careers and now you have all this wisdom you've accumulated in your life and like now you're just going to go like you know uh, go on permanent vacation semi-retirement like Mm -hmm. that's uh you're sort of abdicating and then when after that occurred i thought about um you know that 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 that, the line from jordan about um 
with something like all the responsibility you abdicate will be taken by tyrants. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, it's like, I've had this conversation oh, with so many oof. influential people now, which is essentially that if you don't do what someone else is, and so at the moment, you know, I'm 33, I'm pretty young, I'm still, you know, have, have other things going on. Uh, I have no interest whatsoever sure. uh, in a political career. It sounds, it sounds awful. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess like, you know, maybe ne never say never, but right now I, I, sure. I, I almost want to say never. Yeah. Well, I will say yeah. I, we didn't get to do it today on purpose cause your book is coming out, but I do think that your story, I've not gotten to read it all. Uh, whether, you know, the, the, I don't know how deep it goes, but the, the, the deeper it goes, I think that's a profound impact that you could have just the, the going through what you went through and having other people encounter that, see that as an example, or just as a, holy shit, someone was here or in a worse place with me, I think is deeply powerful, perhaps more powerful than you would as like a congressman or anything like that. So I don't think that we're limited to just political ways of contributing. And uh, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited to read your book. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, that's that's the goal. I mean, I hope it I hope it uh, reaches people. And, uh, you know, I wrote it to be understood by everyone, regardless of age or political persuasion. I mean, it's they think it has like this sort of universal message. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Well, let's let's wrap there. I did have one more question, but that was too perfect. So <laughs> we're going to settle right. there. Um, I've subscribed to your Substack. I've enjoyed it. I know that uh, that's something that you wanted to point people towards. You do have uh, articles that you can check out. What's the website? Uh, robkhenderson.com. So just rob the letter K henderson.com. Cool. And I just found it by Googling Rob Henderson. And I think it was the first yeah, or second thing too. that came up. Um, yeah. There's free articles. And then also you have monthly Substack subscription. How is that? I, I do want to yeah. ask, how is that going as like a business yeah. model? Do you, are you, uh, is that working for you well? Oh yeah. Yeah. Extremely, extremely well. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I've been, um, yeah, I mean, it pays the bills. I mean, that's sort mm -hmm. of, you know, one, one main funnel of, of income for me is my Substack. So yeah, I have that kind of freemium model. Most of the articles are free. I would say 70, 80% of the articles I put out are free, but mm -hmm. you know, there are some paywalled posts. Um, but I've been, you know, I've also maintained a newsletter now for going on what, what, uh, three years now. And so I think, you know, I've, I've sort of built up a, a bit of a readership and that's, yeah, it's been, it's been going really well. I, yeah. I, Substack has been, you know, it's been, it's been amazing. I saw you're speaking at the all in summit. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be out in LA next month. Yeah, in in, in September. So yeah, I'll be speaking with uh, John Moth and those guys. So I'm doing a uh, presentation and then uh, moderated discussion. That's amazing. Uh, and should we expect yeah. to see you in more like speaking gigs? Is that in your future as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll probably do uh, do do a few more. Um, and and yeah, again, if you just uh, follow my follow my Substack, I'll be posting dates and everything. And uh, yeah, yeah, learn, you'll learn more. Amazing. All right, thank you so much. Is there anything that you wanted to add before we before we wrap? Uh, no, 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 let's cover it. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Charlie.